Yeah, before we start, just a few introductions. Uh, as Steffi says, uh, to introduce uh, Alexander Kluge, it would take us the whole evening because Alexander has done so many uh, extraordinary, extraordinary things. He is, of course, um, at the origin of the amazing DCTP television program. He's a filmmaker, a literary author, has done extraordinary collaborations with artists recently, one of which actually started at DLD three years ago with Katharina Grosse, um, has done seminal films, uh, published uh, literally hundreds of books. And we were recently actually with Steffi in the Brain Lab here in, in Munich, uh, having an amazing evening as only Steffi could do it, bringing together people from many different worlds. And Alexander was there and in the car on the way to this amazing, amazing place here in Munich called the Brain Lab, we actually spoke with Alexander about gaming. And uh, gaming is the theme of uh, an exhibition I'm actually putting together for this summer, which will happen in Düsseldorf at the Julia Stoschek Collection. Keiken and also Gabriel Massan are part of this, of this show. Uh, Keiken is a collective living between London and Berlin, collaboratively building and imagining a metaverse to simulate new structures and ways of existing and to test drive possible futures, really. Um, installations which often involve gaming, but also uh, lots of physical components, so it's mixed reality in some way, we can say. Gabriel Massan combines storytelling and world-building techniques to create and narrate situations of inequality simulated by the live performances of digital sculptures in the metaverse. There is an interest in the notion of strangeness and actually ignorance in the imaginary of the third world concept, as uh, Gabriel pointed out. And um, uh, uh, one of the new projects is a collaboration, actually, with our technology uh, curatorial team at the Serpentine, uh, with um, uh, the, the big team involving Victoria Ivanova, Tamar Clark Brown, Eva Jäger, Alex Boyce, and Case Watson, who have for many, many months now intensely worked with Gabriel um, on this piece, which will also be seen in, in Düsseldorf. And we thought it would be wonderful to have case studies here, actually, by Keiken and Gabriel on gaming, and at the same time, Alexander telling us about uh, a historic dimension also, which goes back, actually, far back to the 19th century. Um, and also, Alexander will tell us why Karl Marx thought that games are important. The exhibition in Düsseldorf will be called World Building. As Steffi said, as of last year, 2.8 billion people, which is almost a third of the world population, are playing video games. And of course, it's urgent, we think, to examine the various ways in which artists have actually interacted with video games and made them into an art form. And that goes from single-channel video works to site-specific immersive environments. Uh, we have, of course, artists already since the 80s, if you think about Sturtevant, who have actually brought in you know, video games <coughs> into their art. We have also artists who go into kind of mainstream video games of course, Ariana Grande, uh, Travis Scott made performances uh, on Fortnite. Um, and at the same time, we had the collaboration with Cars. You know, so that's the idea of actually going um, as an artist into a game and through that reaching audiences of hundreds of millions. I mean, the exhibition of Cars, I think, was visited by 150 million people in the virtual Serpentine and brought in whole generations of people who will never come otherwise to the museum, to the museum. But what we're going to talk about today, actually, is um, with um, uh, the artists here present, is about artists inventing their own games. And that's obviously only become, become possible recently through the availability of technology. So we have a whole new generation of artists uh, inventing incredible games, very often games which are super different from the kind of mainstream games we know and which kind of as often artists show us the future, will show us the future and connecting, of course, that's also where the metaverse, in a way, is invented. Please give another very warm welcome to our amazing group of artists. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought maybe we could begin um, with Kaken telling us a little bit about uh, what you're working on at the moment, the games you're, you're inventing. <laughs> yeah, so I guess like we're currently working on this like 
XR series, primarily working a gaming engine, and we're looking at morphic angels. So we're imagining like what would the future be like in 500 years. So we've been looking at neuroscientists like Michael Levin, Donald Hoffman, and looking at how um, our understanding of science will completely change in the future. That it's very much going into a much more of an immaterial understanding, learning what consciousness is, being able to reverse engineer consciousness, being able to use morphogenesis to be able to create transhumanism, and how that would be applied to the future. What would culture be like in the future? Would we be defined by our upgrades? So we're looking at really trying to imagine, kind of in many ways, like every aspect we can imagine. This has been very challenging and very painful <laughs> to do. But we, through using these different XR technologies, so for example, being able to go inside a VR and become a non-human creature and being able to play part of a series or being able to play a game or being able to watch a film, we're trying to really imagine how in the future the way that we perceive human beings is maybe we are like morphic angels, we are morphogenous angels, the way that we understand our consciousness will be much more multiplicit. The way that we understand human, humanity, uh, our problems, our suffering may be different. So we're looking at how the evolution of humans will turn into angels, and then through <laughs> that... Okay, this is making maybe not sense to other people, but this makes complete sense to us. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to add also that um, with this series, we, I think... It initially started out with like one narrative that we were working on, and then mm -hmm. we realized that we have, you just can't approach the future 500 years from now in one thing. <laughs> you have to like, um, we just have so many different kind of narratives that we're beginning to develop, and it really makes sense for us to work with all these different new technologies and mediums that will allow mm -hmm. us to have like, different levels of interaction for the audience as well, so the audience will get to have more of an, more of an immersive experience. It won't just be like listening to our story or watching our film. They'll actually be able to, I guess, like simulate or embody a morphic angel as well. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about the, the actual installation? Because you include lighting, you include props very often. It is really mixed reality. And in a way, um, it's both sort of virtual, but it's also very embodied, your mm -hmm. installation. It would be interesting to hear yeah. more about that. So the piece that we're showing is called Play as a Cosmic Realm, which is an immersive installation. And we have two pieces, one called, which is a interactive film, which is called The Life Game. And then there's also this piece called um, Better Bodies, which, where we've created our own technology, which is a haptic, haptic wearable womb, where we've inputted the data of different animals inside the womb. And this came from a performance that we did in 2017. So a lot of our um, works come through performance and being able to simulate experiences and actually role play what do people do in those situations. And so everybody in this performance, it was a durational performance for three days, and there was multiple people, and they all wore a silicone womb. And what we realized from this was that, one, the womb is genderless, and two, that it's an incredibly, people have very emotive and cathartic experiences, and they're very animistic with it. So they really cannot, um, they feel like it, they are simulating some form of pregnancy or something, or some association. Something is coming from them because everyone came from the womb. So, um, so yeah, so we've been really exploring this and then trying to then input uh, like, what happens if we input the data of something that people don't relate to very well or things that they don't identify with easily? So what happens if we put the data of the... We put animals that could communicate through ultrasound and we inputted the data inside the womb. So when people experience it, they can... Act What's really amazing is that the sound travels inside the womb, but it becomes three-dimensional. So the silicone kind of traps the sound. So you actually feel... You're, you're understanding data from your stomach and it feels like it's part of you, but you also feel sound in a three-dimensional way as if it's extended inside your body. So it's like 
people have crazy experiences in it. And it tends to be on the spectrum of either it's cathartic and emotional because they have some sort of, um, they have some sort of association <coughs> to this area that is um, maybe traumatic or something like that, or it um, activates their um, imagination. So they start having a lot of visualizations, or the other one is that it becomes very meditative and it allows people to concentrate and just be in the present moment because they are feeling with their whole body. Yeah, and I, I think also, like, it, it really is also a very innate reaction to it. it mm -hmm. I mean, people, they don't, people want to talk about it immediately once they've mm -hmm. come out of the experience because it's such an unusual thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think also, like, because we've used such a range of different animal noises, it also creates a very, like, a, a journey that you go through. It's this rhythm of different, um, different three-dimensional sounds, but some really feel very like pointed and very kind of aggressive, and others feel really, I don't know, like a, like a big wave kind of traveling through your body. So it also, in the overall kind of exhibition of these two works, it's really, we're kind of imagining the future of gaming environments and how we can kind of create gaming environments or games themselves, which can be more holistic and more cosmic in themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yes. oh. <laughs> like when you think of something like a VR, a lot of technology is not only is it, you know, really obviously you're using like your limbic and reptilian brain for everything, it's constantly happening. But at the same time, like say if you go on the computer screen, it's constantly decision making, it's visuals, a lot of them are misleading symbols. Whereas this really takes you back to like be inside yourself. And what we really recognize from creating a very, um, an organic technology that is completely um, to do with something that's innate within human beings and all different beings, the technology that we were creating and how it's programmed is completely different to the way, and the logic to it is completely different to the way the VR or corporate technologies are often created, and that you realize actually how vastly different they are. Like, we're approaching it a very different way, and you realize actually how stern these technologies are, how um, kind of um, disconnected, disconnected to embodiment, how um, defeminized they are, how... Um, inorganic they are, to, and humans need to feel their, um, they need that to make sure that when they are thinking of future gaming environments, that they think of their consciousness being transported into another realm, and that is something that is very spiritual, and we're trying to really like, yeah, reposition those things. Thank you so much, and that aspect of the organic brings us also right away, actually, to Gabriel's work, and uh, to the terraforming project. And we're now gonna hear from Gabrielle. Before then, Alexander will give us an overall context, and then we'll have more general questions. Mm -hmm. So, Gabriel, I was wondering, because you're gonna show in, in the exhibition in Dusseldorf at the Julia Stoschek Collection actually two works. You're gonna show the terraforming work. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, terraforming is not only earth shaping, but it's also making an environment habitable. And I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about that. And, it's a very collaborative work, and I think one thing which is also really interesting is that these games um, are very often collaborative, having a collaborative authorship. It's no longer just one artist doing it. It's, it's interdisciplinary. We're going to hear from Alexander afterwards about what he calls the separatrix. Um, and this, this interdisciplinarity is incredibly strong also in your, in your work. You work with music, uh, you work with many different practitioners. It would be great to hear about Terraforming, and then also about the new work, which is the uh, project, which is a collaboration with uh, Arts and Technologies at the Serpentine, which is um, a very, you know, a, a process which is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, should I? Can I change? Oh, it's already there. So I think with terraforming, um, the main idea was the, the first time that I could present more than 50 sculptures in the same composition. So I did somehow like five different worlds, and then within that, like each world had like in turn of like 50 sculptures. And since it was my second experience with like creating this kind of interactiveness with the audience, because first one was Iroko, and I think the difference the difference between both is that um, I think I'm learning and and how to educate the people to access the work in a way that I'm presenting a new world, but you need new forms to contact with this world and not 
applying the same signs as before, because I think when we are entering in a new platform or in a new way of like being surrounded by other beings and other like um, objects, we are always proclaiming the same structures that we were presented in the past, like co with colonialism, like we always searching for this kind of structures. And I think with terraforming, the main idea was, and if something was being shaped, but it didn't have like a meaning, you know? So I started with that, like creating something with no context at all. But imagine if this was like really organic, because I like to play with the organicity of like digital sculptures and imagine how they can perform life even though they are not alive. It so I think it comes from that and the connection between this work and the new work for Serpentine is that and and the VR uh, experience with Transmoderna, the terraforming is like more about you with your own eyes going into this experience, but it's all like already like programmed. And like with the new game, Third World, that I'm developing, it's more on how to be in this space that you don't know anything. It's really like about not being comfort with the things that are being confronting, you know? Like, the things are coming to you and you don't really know how to communicate. So there's no map, there's no instructions, and you are there as with, like, blind eyes, and the only thing that you need to do is choose between these two systems. Like, one is the world, what the world is telling you, and what the system that is in you telling you. So we are, like, playing with these two, like, consciousness, and... This is really important for me because uh, working with other people is also adding um, meaning to this whole like um, intention. Because since in this work I'm calling it third world, it wouldn't be nice or like you'd be so superficial if I was only talking about my own experience. So I've been invited like so many artists and developers to have like a like a portion in that creative like experience and in terraforming we are also like creating with like the the animator that was working with me he was also adding his inputs because i think this idea of the work being mine is not really something that that i like to proclaim because in the end i'm i'm creating for others and also like i'm bringing these new experiences to like re-educate and rethink the way we are diving into the world right now. So it's more about uh, knowledge, you know? And how will it evolve over time? Because as far as I understand, <laughs> we're going to have a beginning of the work and then it's going to evolve over the next... Because that's also, yes. I think, interesting is that it's a different time horizon <laughs> with games. First of all, it takes a long time to make them. Um, and then at the same time, they obviously continue to change, to evolve, also through the interaction, which is also why it's exciting that the exhibition will have the unusual length of 18 months. It's basically going to be the whole building in Düsseldorf, and for 18 months, the show will continue to change. Can you talk a little bit about that? Also, the long, I'm interested in this long durational aspect, no? which gets us out of sort of event culture in a way. Yes. Uh, oh. I don't know if there's videos here. Yeah, it's oh, moving. It's moving, I think. <laughs> So, like, uh, in the first beginning, it's because since I'm still developing the work, it's like a one-year commission, I wanted to also test on how to um, present this as something that is, like, growing and growing and growing and growing, like uh, it's alive, you know? So, first, we're starting with, like, start screens, so you can only have, just to build this intention to play, like with the audience, so you're there and you need to like press space, but it's not press space. The phrase that goes with the works like close your mind to start. So within that, like the next uh, possibility with it will be like the interaction, just like all the screens changing and you can choose between like 
one of these environments. And by that, we'll be like adding the controls and adding like the keyboard and adding like a seat. So I think it's interesting to, to be open about how this process can work and cannot work. And it involves many collaborators, Castiel, Vittorino, Basiliero, Novissimo, Etka, Masako, Virano, Lisa, Carlos, Minozzi, Alexander Pina. It's a long list. <laughs> and that brings us to yes. Alexander Kluge. We're now going to switch to German. Eduard Lissa always says multilingualism is important, so we're going to have a German chapter of this panel, and then <laughs> we'll come back to all of you with more general questions about relationships to games and, and so on. Deshalb, Herr Kluge, wollte ich Sie fragen, weil uh, die, wir hatten ja viele Begegnungen hier in München yeah. um, seit über 20 Jahren und es kam oft auch Zusammenarbeit mit, 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 mit Künstlern, mit Künstlerinnen und Ihnen. Und vor drei Jahren kamen Sie eben hier zur Begegnung mit Katharina Grosse, es entsteht jetzt ein großes Buch. Und Sie haben ja diesen Begriff der Separatrix, ähm, den ich sehr interessant finde im Zusammenhang, was wir gerade gehört haben, dieses Zusammenkommen der Welten. Da wollte ich Sie fragen, uns vielleicht dazu ein bisschen zu sagen, über die Zusammenarbeit, über Separatrix. Und dann habe ich noch Fragen zu den, zu den Games und zu Spielen. Also, ähm, das war Ihr Verdienst, ja, dass Sie mich mit Katharina Grosse zusammengebracht haben. Und sie hat noch am Nachmittag unserer ersten in unseren ersten Treffens hier auf der DLD gesagt, wir wollen zusammenarbeiten. Und das ist inzwischen jetzt ein Buch, das im September erscheint. Und das wird auch mit Ausstellungen verbunden sein, die aus den Bildern, die man hier entwickelt hat, ja, äh, entstanden sind. Und äh, Separatrix ist ein Begriff von Leibniz, ja, der sagt, äh, an der Nahtstelle zwischen zwei Unvereinbarkeiten, also zwischen Tag und Nacht oder zwischen Rot und Blau. Ja, äh, da entsteht eine ganz kreative ja, Stelle, das nennt er die Separatrix. Und so glaube ich, dass zwischen den Künsten und den Wissenschaften, also zwischen der Musik und der Literatur, der, äh, den klassischen Künsten und der Wissenschaft, mhm. immer ein Funke sprüht. Ja? Die Haut ja, ist mhm. das Senior. Ja, was äh, das Neue hervorbringt, mhm. ja? nicht das Zentrum. Ja? Und äh, darauf haben wir, es gibt ein 600-seitiges Buch, ja? sie hat Aquarelle gemal gemalt dafür und auch ist übergegangen zu Zeichnungen, was ich sehr interessant finde. Ja? Und äh, ich habe es mit Geschichten verbunden, jeder bleibt bei seinem Metier. Aber wenn man diese zwei Metiers zusammenfügt, ja, dann kommt etwas Interessantes, was hier mit Zukunft, mit Realität, mit Antirealität, wenn man so will, ja, also dem Gegenpol, mit Heterotopie ja, etwas zu tun hat. Ja, und das ist ähm, etwas, was mich befriedigt, Sie befriedigt und hier gut in diese äh, Veranstaltung passt, die ja Menschen zusammenbringt, die Zusammenhänge ja, wie sonst nirgends zusammenführt. Also. Das tun ja Spiele, äh, nicht nur virtuelle Spiele, wie wir sie jetzt äh, immer mehr erleben, sondern auch analoge Spiele. Die Surrealisten hatten den Exquisite Corps, das wunderbare Spiel, äh, was immer weiter gespielt werden kann heute und immer noch aktuell ist. Und sie sagten heute, dass, ähm, dieses, dass Karl Marx auch darüber gesprochen hat, dass <lacht> Arbeit ohne Spiel dumm macht. Ja. Das ist ja interessant, dass dieser doch steife Mann, ja, der als Ökonom sozusagen äh, da tätig ist, eben sagt, es gibt einfach im Menschen äh, und übrigens auch in Bibern und in vielen Tieren mhm. ja, eine Grundannahme, ja, äh, dass also nicht nur die ernsten Aufmerksamkeiten, sondern auch das Spiel ganz ernst ist. Und wenn Sie ein Kind sehen, das spielt, das ist eine Aufmerksamkeit, eine Intensität, eben ein Ernst. Also Spiel ist ernst. Und zwar ist ein großer Freiheitsgrad mit verbunden. Es gibt meinetwegen Arbeit. Dann gibt es, sagen wir mal, Reparieren, Heilen, Denken, Erfinden. Eine ganze Menge Schlafen, Träumen. Ja? Und dann gibt es Spielen. Ja? Und ich habe mal... Ähm, gesehen, einen, einen Film, in der eine Arbeiterin mechanisch immer wieder einen bestimmten Vorgang machen muss ja, und in einem bestimmten Abstand 
Flügelartig breitet sie die Arme aus, dass es spielen. Ja? Das heißt, es, der, im Menschen steckt ja, etwas und das will spielen. Und deswegen sind Games also äh, gewissermaßen etwas Notwendiges. Und wenn wir heute in einer bitteren Wirklichkeit leben, äh, zum Beispiel wenn wir auf die Ukraine blicken, dann ist es so, dass die Realitäten eigentlich fast keine Notausgänge zeigen. Dass man nicht weiß, keiner weiß, ja, mhm. äh, wie man das lösen kann. Und da ist es sozusagen fast notwendig, dass man einen Moment neben die Realität tritt und sich vorstellt, wenn ein Wunder geschehe, Putin fällt tot um, ja, was würde die Seele von Gorbatschow, die in seinen Nachfolger schlüpft, machen? Nicht jeder glaubt, dass die Seele schlüpft. Aber dennoch, äh, die Vorstellung gibt Freiheit und das ist Game. Ja? Ein Theater ist zum Beispiel, oder eine Oper, ja? die Musik überhaupt. Ja? Das sind alles, da badet, badet die Seele drin. Ja? Und das ist eine Freiheit. Und die Freiheit ist nur ein anderes Wort für Spielen. Und Sie wollten vorher drei Beispiele geben, haben wir heute Nachmittag besprochen. Und das beginnt mit 1800 und führt uns dann ins, ins, ins Weltall. Das ist ja eine große äh, Sammlung von Spielen, ja, die sich mit dem Beginn der zweiten äh, bürgerlichen Gesellschaft, also der industriellen Revolution, befasst um 1800. Mhm. Ja. Und äh, das ist eben nicht nur Krieg mit Napoleon, ja, sondern es ist auch Erfindung. Das ist die Dampfmaschine. Mhm. Ja. Das ist der Anfang von etwas sehr Hoffnungsreichem. Mhm. Und dass das in Form von Spielen man sich hineinversetzen kann, aus unserem 21. Jahrhundert, dorthin. Ja? Das würde dann auch ermöglichen, dass ich von dort Kräfte nehme und die ins 21, 22. Jahrhundert, ne, ins Jahr 2022 trage. Ja? Das ist etwas Zeitperspektiven, Raumperspektiven in der Kunst sind bekannt. Ja? Die Zentralperspektive. Aber es gibt auch die Zeitachse, die Zeitperspektive. Und etwas in die Zukunft zu schaffen und etwas gewissermaßen äh, an Kraft aus den Vergangenheiten zu holen, ist nicht zu unterschätzen. Das ist die Grammatik der Künste, ja? in den Zeiten, ja? in den Möglichkeiten, in den Wirklichkeiten zu spielen. Und also ich kann nur sagen, ich würde mehr von dem Gaming erwarten für zukünftige Kunst, ja? als nur von den traditionellen Künsten. Aber dass dieses Gaming auch mit den traditionellen Künsten engen Kontakt hält und Musik aufnimmt ja, und äh, die Nahtstellen überwindet, wo die Künste so getrennt arbeiten, ja, auch Wissenschaft zum Beispiel, ja, also Kosmos meinetwegen, was die Sterne tun. Wir sprachen heute über Meteorologie im Kosmos. Das sind alles Dinge, ja, sich da hinein zu versetzen, ist Gaming. Da gibt es im wenn Sie nicht auf, im Süden unserer Erde, würden Sie in den Abgrund, einen Abgrund gucken, der führt auf die Mitte der Milchstraße zu. Und wenn Sie nach Norden gucken, sehen Sie das Sternbild des Perseus. Und da gibt es über 600 Lichtjahre hinweg, das ist eine ziemlich lange Zeit und eine große Strecke, gibt es einen Sturm, der schon mehrere Millionen Jahre weht. Das ist doch ein Gefühl, von unserem kurzen Leben her gesehen, von unseren Problemen, die recht kleinteilig manchmal auch sind auf unserer Welt, ja, sich ein Weltraumwetter vorzustellen ja, und damit rumzufahren. Ja, würde ich gerne mal machen, könnte ich nur im Game. Ja. Und diese Dinge, das ist etwas, wo ich glaube, dass wenn wir zusammenarbeiten, ja, auch mit heute äh, den Künstlern, den ich kennengelernt habe. Es kam zu einer Be Begegnung zwischen Ihnen und Refik Anadol. Das hat mich ganz entzückt. Ja. Ja, nicht? Und das hat Kraft. Ja? Und das bewegt sich. Und äh, das kann zusammenarbeiten. Also ich würde so sagen, wenn die Sterne miteinander verkehren, tun sie das nicht über Stangen und Schrauben, sondern über die Konstellation, über Gravitation. Mhm. Ja? Ihre Substanz ist das, was sie zusammenhält und führt. Ja? Konstellation und Spielen ist konstellativ. Ja? But that's beautiful, that games are constellations. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can bring that back to 
Kaken and also to Gabrielle uh, <laughs> to tell us more about this. And I was particularly curious because Alexander Kluge mentioned this idea of bringing in, you know, if you think about this idea of, of games maybe becoming a form of Gesamtkunstwerk in the 21st century, it means also bringing in music. But he also mentioned cosmology, science. So it would be great to hear a little bit how, in your practice, working on these video games, you connect to music and science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess, like, with games, I do love that you talk about it being constellations, because the idea of a game is creating a world. You're creating new laws and structures. So you're trying to basically subvert reality and allow people to exist in different dynamics and ways. So, for example, the life game we play is we use <coughs> money as a form of exchange, and that's like our tool. Like, in a game, you have your sword or you have, you know, something like that. So in what you're talking about is like really you just need to create these, you need to be able to create games to be able to see the world differently. And people learn through experience. So you need to be able to create new environments, new laws of structures. <coughs> you need to create different types of symbols similar to what Gabriel you're talking about so that we can try to simulate new laws and structures which we inhabit in different worlds and different realms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I think this is, is I my voice is all. coming. Oh, yeah, now, now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is also super interesting <laughs> about your practice because, like, um, I think imagine like a belly and connecting like a human body to like a fake belly. Mm -hmm. This is also like science and how to like these can be immer like merged together mm -hmm. to to create some, like a, an experience. I think for me, what I really like the most is like mixing uh, my games with like my notions of geography, because I think geography is the way we access the world in a, in the way like um, how how the things are formed and and how you d interact with the weather and how you go to location, uh, because my life has been so marked by this um, going around the city or like observing how the city was so swallowing like nature and all those things and how it was so hard for me to, to get in the center. So it's all about like um, this, the, how long is to take, how long it takes to, to go to some places and bringing this time frame inside the game and, and also bringing this like, this way of how to build all these senses of like, uh, Am I aware of the time? Am I aware of the, the soil that I'm like putting my foot in? Like, how can I construct that inside a game? You know, how can I construct this all kinds of notions for you to be really like immersed? Thank you so much. I know we are out of time. We had a whole question now, but out of that, you know, <laughs> we we put that online. I mean, maybe I just want to have one question out of the long question now to you all, which I thought would be kind of nice to wrap it up, which is, how do you think can games improve the world? <laughs> well, I think it can be, they can be like the best tool in a way, because it's, you, a game is something that you can allow someone to go completely inside of a new wor world, and it, like we were talking about, just completely simulate something entirely new, something that we're, is beyond the physical realms of what you understand, and being able to do that is, like really revolutionary, I think. <laughs> yes. I think it's similar to like, you know, like uh, for example, you know Yuval Noah Harari, he spoke a lot about how the, we understand the world through narrative, but actually I think the new thing is gonna be more about how we understand, because it's very in the collective consciousness now that we understand the world through narratives that we tell and we build the future through the narratives we tell. But really we are gonna do it through games, so in the future everything's gonna become much more interlocked with one another. So for example, you might go to game, but actually that gaming is that actually has purpose that interacts with uh, some sort of agricultural farm somewhere on the other side of the world. So you'll be directly integrating with one another. So I think games are just fundamental to the way that we understand and build the world. And it will be much more intersectional than we can ever imagine it to be in the future. Mm. I think with games is interesting, like for me, is to, to observe the mechanisms, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. that we also have like in real life, but like, how can games also be tricky, you know? Mm -hmm. Like to present something to you, but at the same time, it's not what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I think 
playing with that also, like with the notions of violence, of the notions of like comfort. Uh, I think games is all about like how you can reimagine situations mm -hmm. and how you can place different people like in different situations also. Mm. Maybe to wrap it up, one very last question to Alexander Kluge. Heute Nachmittag sagten Sie Utopie, Heterotopie und Realität. Können Sie vielleicht das nochmals zusammenfassen, was das die bedeutet gehören, im Zusammenhang mit Spielen? Herr Obrist, die gehören zusammen. Ja? Äh, die Realität ja? Nicht? Das ist das Thema hier unserer Veranstaltung. Und äh, die Wünsche sind aber auch Realität. Mhm. Ja? Und äh, insofern äh, ist die Ut das Utopische ja, immer gegenwärtig. Wenn Sie es wegziehen, ist die Realität nicht mehr realistisch. Und dann gibt es noch etwas, was sehr seltsam ist. Nämlich ganz dicht neben der Realität gibt es die Heterotopie, ja, mhm. die andere Möglichkeit. Mhm. Ja. Und die heißt, in uns zum Beispiel sind so viele Quanten, ja, sind Dinge in Plancklänge, das heißt so klein, ja, wie die Materie in Wirklichkeit äh, ihre robuste Grundlage hat. Ja. Das heißt, wir sind eben nicht nur das, was wir sind, ja, sondern wir sind außerdem noch alles Mögliche kleinere und größere. Ja. Und das ist die Heterotopie, so dass wir also gewissermaßen <lacht> dicht neben uns ja, immer noch etwas anderes haben. So deswegen es geht, das, was im Spiel so schön ist, ist die Aufhebung des Sinnzwangs. Ja? Nicht? Und äh, das ist etwas Berechtigtes. Das ist nicht nur für Dada gut. Ja? Mhm. Sondern es ist überhaupt gehört zur Wirklichkeit, dass immer in der Wirklichkeit noch eine zweite steckt. Ja? Wahrscheinlich mehr eine Tausende stecken. Ja? Mhm. Und diese mhm. Vielfalt, das ist das, was mit Gaming zu tun hat. Mhm. Ja? Also die Natur selbst. Ja, die Evolution, ja, alles das ja, ist eigentlich ein ganz riesenhaftes Spiel. Ja, nicht? Im positivsten Sinne, ganz ernst. Ja? Also das ist nichts, äh, nichts, dass man sagt, bloß Spiel. Ja? Das wäre genau falscher Ausdruck. Also das heißt, Arbeit, nur Arbeit ohne Spiel macht dumm. Das ist Karl Marx. Ja? Das ist ganz tief wahr. Ja? Mehr kann ich dazu nicht sagen. Vielen Dank, Alexander Kluge. Vielen Dank, Gabriel Massa. Vielen Dank, Helfen. Thank you all so much. And we hope uh, that you can all come in June, uh, or any time from June for the next 18 months to Düsseldorf to see the exhibition at the Julia Storche Collection. Many, many thanks go also to Julia, of course, go also to Anna Pfau and to Adele Köchlin, who is here. And as always, Uh, all thanks go to Steffi no, to you. and to the DLD Dream Team yeah. and our Very amazing speakers. speakers. This is DLD, meine Lieben. This is DLD. And I'm so proud of each of you. Each of you. You are the future. You are the future and we had a glimpse into it. And Alexander Kluge, you made my day. And, yeah, wasn't he wonderful? He's the future also. I, I'm, to be honest, inviting Alexander Kluge and Hans Ulrich, it touched my heart so much because he spoke about the reality which rules, but he spoke with a deep, deep, deep humanistic view of reality. And I wish, if I have a wish, that you share his thoughts that you get into, his, into your vision. <laughs> really, I think it's so important. We can learn so much from you, Alexander. And from you, we have, can learn from all of you. And this deal is a learning experience. And thank you for being here, and see you tomorrow. Thank you, Shafi. Thank you so much. <laughs>